Hi, I'm Paul Comfort. Welcome to Transit Unplugged. Today's guest is Andy Byford, CEO of the Toronto Transit Commission. I talked with him recently in Atlanta at the APTA Expo, where he was there to pick up his systems award for the best large transit system in North America. We'll ask him how he won it. Of Transit Unplugged. What does it mean to be a successful public transit agency? What are you doing to lead the way? It's time to learn from the top transit professionals in North America. This is Transit Unplugged with your host, Paul Comfort. Hi, I'm Paul Comfort with our Transit Unplugged podcast again. And today I'm thrilled to have as my guest, Andy Byford, who is the CEO of the Toronto Transit Commission, this year's APTA winner of the large transit system, the best transit system in North America. Great to have you with us, Andy. Well, it's great to be here. I mean, obviously we're absolutely pumped to have won that award, uh, but it's always good to come to APTA. You meet great people like yourself. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so um, today uh, people are always interested in, you know, I mean, you're like one of the top transit leaders in the world. You've been all over. Tell us a little bit about your career and how you ended up in Toronto. So I, um, to a certain extent, I got into, I wouldn't say got into transit by accident, although it kind of was. I was always, as a kid, interested in transit, but I grew up in Plymouth in England, which is a big Navy city. It's where the Royal Navy is based, um, one of the Navy bases. So I toyed with going into the Navy, uh, but then I'd always been interested in uh, transit, so I ended up going to university rather than straight into the Navy, still keeping that option open. I did a degree, a joint honours degree in French and German at the University of Leicester. Wow. Toyed then with the Foreign Office, so I was still really making my mind up about what I wanted to do, but I ended up going to a careers fair at which um, the London Underground stand caught my eye, not least because my father worked for London Transport for 12 years, but my granddad drove a bus for London Transport for 40 years. So that's in my blood. I joined the company, became a graduate trainee, um, and basically worked my way up through uh, over 14 years up to general manager of three of the lines. Uh, I, I'm a great believer in developing my own career rather than have someone else do it. Obviously, it helps to have good uh, bosses and mentors. So I then left the Tube to move um, to what was British Rail to get mainline experience. And I worked for two train operating companies over six years as an ops and uh, safety director and then operations director, respectively. Uh, always wanted then to work internationally and to run both trains and stations, which had previously uh, I'd focused on stations for the tube trains for British Rail. Okay. Uh, so I worked for Railcorp in Sydney, Australia. I was the COO. I would still be there today, Paul, had the TTC not come calling. That was um, a golden opportunity for me for two reasons. One, it's multimodal trains, subway or, or sub subways, buses, streetcars, paratrans, and light rail. Okay. But secondly, what I really enjoy is turnarounds. The TTC is a great organization that was somewhat stuck in the 70s and clearly needed. Uh, someone to uh, lead it to to really get it back to being number one in North America. That's what I did, and um, that's why I'm here. And you're today. being recognized for it uh, this week here at APTA Expo. So, um, how long have you been there? As so, CEO? so, I just over five years. So, it's a bit of a baptism of fire. I joined initially as the COO uh, with a view to becoming the CEO if everything went fine. And uh, unfortunately, my predecessor was removed in what can only be described as a political coup. Yes, uh, after I'm just with those. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, after just three months. And so, on the one hand, that was an opportunity because I'd seen enough to know that this needed way more than just some tweaking and a bit of focus on customer service. It needed to be a top to bottom modernization of the mm. company. Um, but the downside was my learning curve, having only just arrived in Toronto three months prior, went through the roof. I'm now five years into it. We launched a five-year corporate plan to modernize the TTC top to bottom. Uh, and it's fantastic to bookend it uh, with this wonderful award. It's um, yeah. it's something we've worked very hard for. And I, I believe we really deserve it. I do too. Um, tell me a little bit about your governance. I know that when I was in your office a few months ago, you have a, like an interesting structure of how your system is governed. We do. So that, um, I had an executive of including myself 13 people that's six men six women all on merit and, and that's something I'm, I'm proud of we'll come back to that as a culture change is my signature policy uh, but my the governance is that we are um, uh, my boss is the chair of the TTC who's an elected politician and he manages a board of seven elected politicians and four private citizens so uh, we report to the TTC board not the mayor people think we report to the mayor but it's actually the the uh, TTC board, um, but I obviously have a lot of interaction with the board and 44 other councillors. Then above that, the province of Ontario.
Ontario and above that the feds. So it's a highly complex, highly uh, political, politicized and very media rich environment. There is literally never a dull moment. Wow. So um, just from a, before we get into the more of the professionals, from a personal perspective, how do you how do you deal with that? I mean, the the stress and the pressure of constantly having to perform. I mean, I'm a you know having been a CEO, I'm a, but tell us a little bit about how you approach sure. that work environment. It's, the, the adjective Paul I normally use is my job is relentless. It just never stops. Not least because being CEO of the TTC and the way I go about the job, which is highly transparent, owning bad news and not hiding from issues. Uh, you are a well-known figure around yes. the city, so you really can't hide. It is relentless with the TTCs in the news every day. So the way I deal with the stress, and it, you know, it can be a stressful job, but uh, to a certain extent, stress motivates me. You, know, you want to do a good job. You're determined to prove the critics wrong. You're determined to take the company forward. Um, I wanted that award not for uh, self-glory, uh, but for the staff, the employees. I really wanted it for the employees, and they are pumped that we've won this award. Um, but the way I deal with the stress, it's a mixture really, very strong marriage, um, my wife and I don't have kids so we're very very close uh, and we spend a lot of time together, we travel a lot together, um, faith and also um, what's the other thing I was going to say? Uh, uh, exercise. I'm a great runner. I uh, enjoy. That's why you're so skinny. I, I, do, <laughs> I do enjoy running. Um, I find you can go for a run with an intractable problem. You can't figure it out. How the hell are we going to fix this? You run, and almost without thinking, your mind orders itself. Yes. And by the end of that run, 5K, 10K, whatever it is, you're, uh, you're, I know what needs to be done. So it's it's really a mixture of those things. Sometimes also not taking yourself or the job, I wouldn't say taking the job seriously, but taking the criticism seriously or personally. Right. Um, and it's certainly a word of advice to anyone who aspires to be CEO, it's worked for me. By all means, read articles about you and what you do and, and the company you lead. Don't read the comments. Uh, they're typically mm. tweets and um, commentary from bloggers. Uh, sometimes it, it can be insightful, but a lot of time it's just depressing, bitchy, and vindictive. Yes, so flamers. I've learned I've learned not to do that. That's good, very good. So tell us now. We'll switch over a little bit to your actual operations. So give us the scope of where sure. where you serve and what what are your operations in those areas. Sure. So the TTC is the third largest transit in North America. As I said, it's got five modes, um, highly integrated, and I, you know, that's one of the many wonderful things I inherited. Is the is the basic design of the TTC is still as good as it ever was. You can come off a subway, in, in say St. Clair West Station, come up an escalator. There's a streetcar waiting on the left and a bus on the right. Fourteen thousand employees, uh, operating budget of around 1.7 billion dollars Canadian. Uh, Ten-year budget or capex budget of around, or we need nine billion. We've got six point nine, so we're a bit of a, a deficit, but a, a healthy chunk of cash nonetheless. Uh, we carry five hundred and forty million riders a year, and we have nearly fifteen thousand employees. So 15, it's a, it's a big, highly unionized wow. organization. It's um, it's the as I said, after New York City and Mexico City, the third largest transit in North America. And you guys there are really, I, I consider you like New York. Um, kind of like a world-class city mm -hmm. um, you know you've got London I've where you worked and I've been on the tube and met with Shashi Verma over there and sure. all those guys and uh, I mean you're competing on a whole different stage really than most transit systems in North America we are I mean so Toronto is very is um, is really aspiring to, uh, to, to to play in that space of the truly world cities you you know Tokyo Paris London New York and, and uh, Toronto is a fabulous place to live. It's it's very uh, beautiful. It's got the, by the lake. Uh, it's it's got clean. A great, it's very clean. Yeah, it's got I love a, that about it. It's got a great downtown. Lots of people live downtown, which I think makes for a more vibrant place to live. But that does mean for transit, uh, heavy demand throughout the day. We have very heavy off-peak traffic, with the traffic, which is very unusual. Yeah, and um, you know the service is pretty much relentless through the day. So. Um, it's it, you know it, it is a it is a constant challenge. We, we're dealing with a triple whammy, not unique to the TTC. Certainly, New Yorkers would res uh, this would resonate with them. Aging infrastructure, dealing with ever greater customer numbers on a finite budget. So uh, it's it's very uh, very challenging for a CEO to have to deal with those three competing objectives. But that's what we've been doing by a five mega project. So let's talk about that. It's perfect. Yeah. So you, here are your pain points. You know, you just sure. gave us the three of them, and then how are you dealing with so, it? So, um, well, in, in a way, there's six mega projects, but okay. um, the number one, in some ways, the, the one that's given, I don't include it as a mega project, is just the basics, Paul, the kind of things you did in Baltimore. 
So uh, it's about driving up punctuality and reliability and cleanliness and information and um, uh, the staff performance. So, so getting the basics right day in, day out so that the customers have a more reliable, more pleasant, uh, more, more um, predictable journey from A to B. And can, so, I, so can I ask you how you're doing that? I mean, uh, what are a couple of things you're uh, doing? To totally all out focus on um, th uh, th things that matter to customers. So we've cut the number of short turns where customers are paid to go from A to C, but their streetcar or bus gets short term for operational reasons at B. That's not what they paid for. So we've cut that by 90%, 90. Oh, that's good, yeah. uh, we have really focused on cleaning up the system. I mean, Toronto is clean, but these, the, these the subway cars uh, prior to my arrival went up and down with garbage on all day. Why? Kind of a no-brainer. They only got litter picked at night. So that's we right. changed that straight away and we now have them litter picked every second trip uh, at the termini and it's noticeably cleaner so that's better for customers it also means less garbage on the stations let's say fewer trips and falls uh, but much less on the track we've cut track fires by 48 wow. percent delay minutes on the subway year over year are down uh, tw uh, delay minutes 21 percent delay incidents by seven percent um, we focused on uh, a proactive maintenance regime not reactive so a lot of this is about changing the way we do things learning from mistakes um, it, running transits like Groundhog Day you should uh, every day you set out to do the same thing but you should always aim to do better than you did the day before that's good and you've been able to um get your team of 30,000 people to, to believe 15, in that? 15, yeah. 15,000, well, yeah. So, 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 so let me just tell you how we did that. One thing that struck me when I got to the TTC was A, um, it was somewhat old fashioned, and that this is why we've been doing this modernization. But in order to do the modernization, I was taken aback to find that there was no corporate plan. There was an annual budget submission, but no corporate plan, strategic plan, no vision statement, mission statement, no customer charter. So these are all fairly basic things to me that we, we put in place, but the main thing was to to come up with a five-year plan that would uh, the the strap line we use is give Toronto a transit system that makes the city proud and um, that's nice. and, and that's basically the mantra around which we built this plan seven strategic objectives around a hundred key work streams uh, including these uh, mega projects which we'll come on to but a plan is not worth the paper it's written on if the employees don't know about it don't buy into it and don't want to be part of it. So I did 83 over a series of, I think, three months, 83 employee town halls. I only missed okay, one. That's good. Andy, and yeah. that was to galvanize the, the employees. And what I said to them in each one was, if we cut out the silly stuff that gets us on the front of the Toronto Sun, if we pull together as one team, and if we up our game, we can get the TTC back to being where it once was, number one in North America within five years, which is another reason I'm so pleased that yes, we did this just year. that. And so that was my deal back to the staff, uh, you, you, and I've credited them with that. That's their, their success, not mine that you did what I asked and look at the result. And, and I knew that apart from the odd Luddite, you were dealing with um, very proud people, people who were second, third, fourth generation TTC, people who'd given 40 years to the TTC and who shared my um, frustration and anger at the way we were portrayed by some sections of the media or even uh, the general public. So I knew that with a bit of kid psychology, I was tapping into or pushing against an open door and they've really embraced it and, and here we are today, pick up the award tomorrow. So I'm talking with Andy Byford, who's CEO of Toronto Transit Commission. You might hear a little background noise. We're out in the hallway uh, next to the big expo, which is held every three years. So that's the first of your really six big ones. But now you're into your five big mega so the projects. The five big yeah. ones then. OK, so uh, we are in no particular order. We are rolling out um, CBTC, Communications Based Train Control, automatic train control signaling on our line one, our busiest line. OK. I was lucky to receive from the excellent work that Gary Webster did, uh, the Toronto rocket trains, which are compatible for CVTC. They weren't um, commissioned for that when I got there, uh, but we're now uh, progressively in phases rolling out this new signaling system, which once it's done end to end, and it needs to be done in phases, will add 25% capacity to that line. Wow, that's So that, great. that's linked very closely to the second mega project, which will conclude by the end of this year, which is a three over $3 billion Canadian, 8.6 kilometer extension to line one up into Vaughan in York region, six stunning new stations, and that will open 69 days from today really? on December 17th. So it's nearly finished. Wait till you see 
see it, Paul. You've got to come, come up, up to there, Toronto. Yeah. It's just, it is spectacular. Wow. And where'd you get the money for that? Uh, that that was again not of my making. It's been uh, that was um, that went back sort of ten, maybe twelve years. Okay. Uh, that it's a tripartite funded or even four four way funded project, but it's not been without difficulties. And I've sweated blood to get that I thing finished. You. So that will be the perfect um, end to our five year plan to open yeah. that. Now, so I've said that that um, that pro that subway will open with. Uh, the new signaling system, it will also open fully equipped with Presto, which is the third mega project, a smart card that is enabling us to finally phase out tickets, tokens, transfers. Really? Um, you know, uh, the tokens are very quaint, but they've yes. had their day. Yeah. So progressively, we're nearly done. We're rolling out a smart card across the TTC. Are you going to do away with cash like they did in London? Uh, not straight away. That's okay. the logical conclusion. But in, but initially, you'll be still able to pay with cash. But it will the number of cash, the amount of cash handling will uh, slash dramatically. Fourth mega project, 204 brand new state of the art, low floor, fully air conditioned, fully accessible, which is the key point. Uh, streetcars, brand new streetcar wow. fleet in a brand new streetcar barn. The streetcar barn is complete, 204 by the end of 2019. We currently have 43 of these beautiful vehicles, Bombardier flexible vehicles okay. in uh, service. The customers love them. And the fifth mega project is the one that a lot of people wouldn't think of. Here's my pitch. Any transit CEO can buy new vehicles, build subway extensions, roll out a smart card, not without challenges, don't get me wrong. The holy grail okay. is to get people to think, act, and behave differently, and not through coercion. Lots of transits, TTC included, have tried the big stick. You know, you'll better do this or else. Uh, absolutely, I want to. I want staff to do the right thing. We hold them to account, but we are changing the culture of the TTC so that the employees understand the value of customer service, understand what's in it for them, understand the, the benefit of a happier um, traveling public and content politicians who will re invest more money because they like success stories. Uh, so to get people to behave differently is the holy grail. Mm. And, and I've seen this sea change in the way employees are now engaged at the TTC. Uh, there's still more to do, you know, there's still, I mean, the job's not finished. Uh, but it had to start from changing the way we manage because if otherwise you never break out of that cycle of is it the staff are bullshit because managers don't manage them uh, very in a very enlightened manner or the st managers hardline because the employees are bullshit. Someone has to break that cycle. Yes. So I said to my team when I got there, we're going to take the first move uh, from now on. We focus on the good people who are the majority. We cherish them. We develop them. We motivate them. We encourage them. We recognize them, but we don't don't let the few, and it's only a tiny minority, off the hook. And we've um, we've transformed the way we engage with the staff, we reward and recognize them, we communicate with them, and it's really bearing fruit. Those are the uh, mega so projects. It. So your fifth one's really a culture sea change. That's the one that will be my legacy. Uh, that's the one that I think uh, is the most important because you have failed as a CEO if in your tenure, which typically for CEOs tends to be about five, six, seven years, if uh, you make a lot of improvements but the, um, the culture change doesn't then endure. It's not about the CEO, it's not about an individual, it should be just the, you leave it the way things are done around them regardless of who takes over, uh, that then is embedded for the future and that's uh, that's what we're, why we've worked so hard on it. Now Canada uh, doesn't have it, like the ADA law but you've got something similar we right? Did. So tell us a little bit about your paratransit service. Yes we do. So um, it's a very extensive paratransit uh, service actually it's called Wheeltrans and um, it is extensive so we have the um, Ontario uh, accessibility regis uh, legislation that uh, that um, uh, governs us, AODA, and uh, it's very prescriptive. We are bound by uh, provincial law to make the TTC fully accessible by 2025. Wow! So all of our bus fleet is now accessible. The new streetcar fleet that we're bringing in is fully accessible. Uh, the remaining one real remaining challenge is to make our stations accessible. We have 69, soon to be 76 stations. Um, and the uh, we're now at just over the halfway mark. Not easy because you're, you're installing an elevator or, or more than one into a confined footprint in what's often a, um, a quite difficult uh, streetscape, but we're making huge progress. We are trialing new vehicles. We have an excellent uh, accessibility 
uh, advisory committee, ACAT, who advise us and help us on getting the designs right for new vehicles and stations, etc. We hold an annual accessibility forum. We progressively improved our processes so that uh, customers of Wheeltrans feel special and that gives us our highest customer satisfaction, um, which is good because it's contributed to the highest ever customer satisfaction stats. Right now on the TTC, we're at record wow. levels. You're, you're getting it done, Andy. We are piling wow. through. It. But I have a great team. It's not yeah, me. Right. I have I a great team. One thing I'm super proud of, Paul, is five years ago, there had never been a woman on the TTC executive ever. Now, on merit, my executive is made up of six men and six women on merit. No wow. no, no quotas. Right. Positive action, though, to, to make sure that we uh, develop a team and not just at the exec level, but then the head level and the manager level below, that it's more reflective of the city we serve. I'm very, very proud of that. And that in itself has changed the dynamic to have uh, women heading up train crew divisions is almost oh, unheard of. Yeah. But changes the, the materially, tangibly changes the feel and the dynamic within the lunchrooms. I'm sure it does, absolutely, yeah. You, you're doing phenomenal stuff, Andy, it's uh, amazing. We, we're a very motivated team yeah. and we're powering through it. Now, let's not say the job's finished, we still have the odd you know customer service howler uh, the reliability is not uh, as good as it need be just yet and and you know the Toronto media were uh, not unusually um, somewhat skeptical when we won transit of the year there was a lot of scoffing but you know what my are my customers happier yes record customer sat are the employees more engaged yes we now measure that through an engagement survey do our peers uh, the likes of Baltimore Washington, Philly, Chicago, LA, do they think we're doing a good good job? Well, clearly, yes, Absolutely. we won that award. Yeah. So, you know, again, back to my earlier point about don't necessarily listen to the critics, you know, hear what they say. Uh, that's the acid test for me. Do, do they think we're doing a good job? At the end of the day, APTA don't award for perfection, they award for action, and right. that's what we've been delivering. Now, do you outsource any of your work, or do you run it all yourself? We do some. Okay. So, uh, actually, we're, we're remarkably vertically integrated. Nearly everything is done in-house, uh, but with some, it was slightly controversial. We did uh, contract out washroom cleaning, garbage collection, and the bus service lines, where the buses are brought in oh, yeah. by our operators, but then fueled, cleaned, and, and serviced by uh, outside contractors. Controversial with the union, but what I've said to the union is, look, at the end of the day, um, our core business is to move people from A to B on safe, reliable infrastructure and vehicles. That to me is sacrosanct, but it's not really our core business to pick up garbage. That's true, yeah. So um, how's your ridership been since you've been over the five years? Um, in the five years I've been there, we've broken the 500 million mark. We were around 499 when I got there, and we're now around 538. Um, and we, we touched, uh, we were heading towards 540. It's softened, it's still increasing, but at a much slower rate, which is not unusual amongst North American properties. Right. So I think um, Lyft and Uber, and well, not so much Lyft in Toronto, but Uber, uh, and, and just um, low price of gas, there's a number of factors, but we're, we're in the throes of putting together a, a renewed ridership growth strategy, and we think we can get back on a sharply upward trajectory. Now, you've had experience all over the world, England, Australia, Canada. Uh, what do you see as some of the transit trends that are coming that will affect, I know, really changing, I think, what we're doing from transit to mobility in a mm -hmm. larger sense? Talk to that some. Sure. That's certainly the uh, the mantra, and that will be form the backbone of our next five-year plan, which is virtually complete. We want to launch from January 1, 2018, to you know hit the ground running with our new plan. And that's exactly, Paul, what we are saying in our plan. It's about mobility, not just transit. So we are looking for more innovative, uh, first and last mile solutions. Mm -hmm. I definitely see much better use of apps and not just for the customers but to engage with our employees. You know, the days of the sign up where everyone chops into the division to pour through rosters and get called yes. out by the, the by the union clerks, it's kind of quaint, it's great, you get to see people in the lobby, but it's completely archaic. So I'd like to see some sort of employee app. Um, I definitely see more automation in the future, which you know obviously worries the union, but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, de-staffing, it just means um, re-engaging re, uh, or reassigning people to more customer facing roles. And, and as an example, as Presto Smart Card is, uh, the rollout is complete, I'm going to move the collectors from the booth, because there'll be nothing to collect, to be mobile, highly customer friendly, highly proactive, uh, CSAs, customer service assistance. So awesome. I think a lot of 
um, a, a much greater interaction with uh, suppliers to to take us to the next level. Definite automation of train service um, with uh, onboard uh, train attendants or train yes, captains. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think um, uh, much more automation on stations uh, and definitely uh, truly embracing the, the sort of res revolution going on in terms of imparting information to both employees and to customers. I've heard several people say this, and I agree with it. Transit will probably, over the next 10 years, transportation will experience more change in a rapid period than almost any anything other than the medical field. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a big one, I just rode the autonomous shuttle today here. I mean, do you see a role for that? I, I can see that, and I was lucky enough to go on one of those autonomous shuttles in Montreal, if I remember rightly. And, and it's kind of spooky and well, freakish at it first, is, to, yeah. to be honest. You're like, Hang on a minute, not too sure about this. Definitely the way to go. I could see that happening within our lifetime, without yes. question. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, is there anything else like you would talk to a uh, big part of our listeners are transit uh, system employees. So give us like one great thing that you think they could uh, deploy from your experience. What's the, what's the a big thing that will help us improve our transit systems in I, North America? I think to continue, certainly with my wonderful near 15,000 employees, to continue to deploy your passion, your knowledge, your experience. You are the people that make the difference. Uh, on tra in transit with the customers, not the executives sitting on the ivory right, tower on, right. the high, on the high floor. You know, I like I like to think I get out and about. I spend a lot of time with my staff, as I know you did in Baltimore. But um, they're, they're the ones that make the real difference. They're also often the people with the best ideas. They see what works and what doesn't work. So um, make the most of your careers as well. I mean, I started as a station foreman on the tube, and I've somehow made it to CEO <laughs> of TTC. So if I can, you can, go for it. Do the right thing. Uh, do a great job and uh, you know be pushy in your careers and, and aim high. That's certainly my advice to them. And That's great. Uh, I really appreciate what however many hundreds of thousands of uh, transit employees do out there. It's a tough gig. Uh, you know, often people are not appreciated. But I can say for my team at the TTC, I totally appreciate what they do. And tomorrow I'll pick up that award for them with absolute pride. That's wonderful. Our guest today has been Andy Byford, who is the CEO of Toronto Transit Commission, the third largest transit system in North America, who is here at APTA to pick up his award as the best transit system in North America. Amazing. Congratulations. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to see you again. You've been listening to Transit Unplugged, powered by Trapeze Group. To stay up to date, subscribe on iTunes or Google Play, or join the conversation at transitunplugged.com. Thanks for listening.